Hello, and welcome to ASAP's Best Practices in NSCLC Biomarker Testing Virtual Summit. Today's events focus on tissue acquisition and processing. My name is Dara Oken, and I'm a learning experience designer at ASCP, and I will be facilitating today's session. This session is developed through a commercial sponsorship from Genentech. This ASCP Genentech initiative is aimed to support anatomic pathology managers and their teams by building community and providing effective resourcing to drive biomarker testing, continuous quality improvement on behalf of patients. Please note that this video conference is being recorded and by participating, you are agreeing that ASCP may use a recording of your image and statements on ASCP's website. So before we start, let's take a few moments for introductions. Um, if you would, please type your name, title, and institution into the chat. It's great to have you with us today. As you type in your introductions, let's move ahead. Uh, we're going to quickly do a recap as this virtual summit follows a four-part video conference series highlighting best practices throughout the biomarker testing workflow. We've addressed standardizing protocols for optimal specimen handling, actionable results and turnaround time indicators, implementation of guidelines, and LIS EHR implementation and protocol optimization. Our biomarker testing Facebook group and resource hub each house recorded highlights from these presentations and you can watch the videos in full, which are accessible through links in the ASCP resource hub. So the goal of the summit is to narrow our focus on topics that video conference participants have identified as challenges in the lab. So to this end and using the feedback you've provided, We've mapped out this two-day event to address obstacles in the areas of tissue acquisition and processing today, ordering and turnaround time tomorrow. And we'll explore actionable solutions to common challenges in the workflow through examples presented by those who have tackled similar challenges in their own labs. So the action plan has been central to this educational initiative as we strive to support AP lab managers in making real and sustainable quality improvements in the lab. The best practices shared today may inform your action plan to address the challenges in your own lab. Today, we will begin with sharing one approach to quality improvements made in the area of tissue acquisition and processing. We'll have a brief Q&A following the presentation and after a short break, there will be a facilitated discussion session, including a bright spot from the field, uh, an additional example of quality improvements made in the lab. And after another short break, we will close with a multidisciplinary panel discussion to explore how teams work through making key decisions. So a few final reminders before we start, please keep your microphone on mute until you raise your hand and are called on to speak during question times. And please do not share any protected health information or personally identifiable information about patients. So we are delighted to welcome Ghazal Khan, Anatomic Pathology Manager 2 from Johns Hopkins Hospital to share with us an approach to quality improvements in tissue acquisition and processing. I'll turn it over to Ms. Khan to begin. Thank you so much, Dara, and for the nice introduction, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining today. Uh, so I am Gazal Khan. Um, you know, I'm here, here at Paul John Hopkins Medicine, and today we will be discussing, I'm going to be sharing, you know, some of the challenges which we have here at John Hopkins Medicine about the tissue acquisition for the um, molecular pathology testing and for biomarker testing. Uh, before um, I just felt that it's, uh, you know, most of us are already aware of the importance of the lung cancer and, you know, why it is important to diagnose them in a timely manner. Uh, this is just like a slide I shared just for an overview that 
we all know lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the world. Um, and the important um, thing which we need to notice is like that 85% of all lung tumors are uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And then the challenging part is that 60% or more lung tumors are diagnosed at an advanced stage, uh, which basically leads to the poor like, prognosis. Uh, this is an important slide. Um, the, you know, the good news is that many mutations actually uh, have been identified, which are um, linked with at least approximately like a 60% of the patient with a non-small cell carcinoma. And since the testing of such um, mutations, most of such mutations are available. So it's actually, you know, it may lead to making a diagnosis for such, you know, mutation may lead to the favorable patient outcome. And this is basically the topic today that how can we just collect the right specimen for uh, such testing. So now we come basically the actual topic that tissue acquisition and the best practices and challenges for tumor markers in our in our laboratories. Uh, this is just like an overview of the specimen collection techniques, uh, which most of the laboratories that actually I was I have to say almost all the laboratories they use in order to collect the specimen for cytology or surgical pathology diagnosis. I mean, these are like fine needle aspiration, core biopsies, some, you know, laboratory, they have a bronchial brush and bronchial washing. These techniques are in place already uh, to collect the specimen to make the diagnosis either for cytology or for surgical pathology specimen. However, when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to molecular pathology testing, even though you may have like a good surgical pathology specimen or cytology specimen, but it does not really mean that you really have the optimal specimen for your molecular pathology um, uh, testing as well. Um, so this is basically just like a little guideline that what is actually needed for uh, molecular pathology testing. And most of the laboratories, they, they use a similar guideline. Uh, so, you know, you have to have, you know, the right type of specimen, like um, a, a cell block or slide, and, you know, tumor requirement is very important. You would like, a, a, as you can see here, um, at least 60,000 cells, they need to be present. You know, the recommendation is 75,000 to 150,000 tumor cells they're talking about. Tumor content should be 20% malignant to non-malignant cells. And then even if the tumor cells are present, 80% of those tumor cells should be nucleated cells. So these are basically just the key requirement in order to have like a successful um, you know, molecular pathology testing on the material you're submitting to the molecular pathology laboratory. The question now comes like, who's gonna be making those decisions, right? So because in your lab, multiple people are handling those specimens, but it does not really mean that those multiple people are capable of determining ahead of time before when they submit the specimen to such laboratories or if the lab is present in your own hospital, that if whether the specimen is good enough for the molecular pathology or not. So um, normally pathologists or like cyto uh, cytologists, uh, sometimes fellows and residents are involved. Uh, those who are basically, um, the, these are the people, those who are trained, you know, and they ensure before submitting, submitting the specimen to those for molecular pathology testing that if the slides or the block, they have enough material for the molecular pathology testing or not. So now let's just uh, think, as I said, you know, there are challenges all of us we face, like in our laboratory, when it comes to molecular pathology specimen, we submit this specimen to certain laboratories and then, you know, we find out that, oh, specimen is QNS. Uh, what are the reasons, you know, I mean, I just discussed just like a few reasons, like some of the stuff like which I have experienced myself, like in, in the laboratory, since non-small cell carcinoma profiling is, is very important, you know, molecular pathology is very important. So both, I mean, we have multiple methods, like I said before, collection of the specimen. So we can use both like a surgical pathology specimen and the cytology specimen for such testing. So like, for, for example, core biopsy. The core biopsy, when you collect, you know, you have like enough material, actually. And then you can see here that um, the tissues usually is uh, whenever if you if you if you collect the right specimen it has enough cells present which is good enough for for those tumor markers. However, um, sometimes you know core biopsy has like its own challenges. Sometimes you know you can collect the core biopsy easily. It's an invasive procedure, and then the patient you're dealing with you know may or may not be able to handle that. Then it just you know the challenge basically comes over there. And CT guided lung FNA specimens are good. You know, you can collect like a diagnostic material. If the adequacy, you know, if cytology is present to perform the adequacy over there is actually really good. 
However, I've also, uh, you know, come across situations when uh, they cannot proceed the procedure, you know, because of the pneumothorax and stuff like that. So even though it, you can collect those specimens, but it may or may or may not, you know, be successful each time. Uh, in, in my practice, even EBIS, TBNA with rapid on-site evaluation, I have experienced as, because I'm a cytotechnologist also, I just felt that this is basically the most effective and efficient method. Uh, EBIS basically is an um, uh, ultrasound technique of, uh, it basically stands for endobronchial ultrasound transbronchial needle aspiration, and rose is like a rapid on-site evaluation. So it basically... Um, it, it, EBIS is a fairly like a new, uh, I would say, method. Uh, it, I think it is introduced in 2007. And then, you know, it basically ensures like uh, optimal specimen, uh, specimen for molecular pathology. So the key fee, key factors when you're collecting the specimen for, for molecular pathology, you have to keep in mind or, you know, anyone who's collecting the specimen or who basically from the, from the laboratory perspective, like, if pathology lab needs to keep in mind is like, what is the biopsy type? I mean, how are we handling the specimen? Are we making smear? Are we making cell block? In what particular type of fixative are we collecting such material? Is it like Hanks formalin, uh, H Hanks solution or formalin or cytolite? And um, everything has its own impact. Whether when the specimen is being collected, are we performing rapid on-site evaluation for the confirmation of the tumor or not? So, like I said before, um, in my in my experience, I just uh, realized that many uh, pathologists or many cytotechnologists they agree on that that we perform bronchoscopy with rapid on-site evaluation is actually basically help us to collect the optimal specimen, which is not only good enough for making the diagnosis for cytopathology, but also it ensures the optimal specimen for molecular pathology testing also. So this is just like a basic algorithm that what we do actually in that. So it's basically to start with like collecting fine needle aspiration with two smear. Your dip quick slide, you make a dip quick slide, which is an air dried slide. You make it, uh, you make it a full smear, two full smear. One of them is a dip quick uh, stain slide. You basically review that slide on site, and if it is positive, you don't have to, you don't have to collect additional, you don't have to make additional smears, I have to say. And then you actually keep on collecting multiple passes. And then basically those passes go directly into the uh, fixative, uh, either the formalin or a cytolite for cell block preparation. And um, however, if you're after performing the rapid onside evaluation, you as a cytotechnologist or cytopathologist find out that you don't have enough specimen, um, you know, you basically ask for extra passes. And then on each pass, you repeat the same rows, which is basically, again, making tuple smear, one stain it with different stain, uh, look in the, under the microscope and then evaluate the cell if they are uh, just to find out if they are diagnostic or non-diagnostic. The second slide always goes back to the laboratory and then it gets stained over there with PAP stain. So this is actually um, when you're performing growth, like something which is very, very important here uh, is just to remember that if you are making your first smear and if it's just not good enough, you ask for multiple passes. Uh, what I've experienced that in that room, uh, there are many people are present, like pulmonologists or like radio, if you're working with radi radiologists, um, and they're present or nurses and other stuff. But sometimes it becomes very challenging uh, to ask for more um, specimen. And sometimes cytotechnologists or cyto even sometimes cytopathologists are like hesitant in asking for more passes. But we always have to remember one thing, that this is actually the only chance that we, where we can just get the enough specimen. If we won't communicate with them, if we won't tell them that we need more specimen, then they will ultimately like, you know, stop the procedure and the patient would go back. And then when the time would come eventually later on uh, to do the molecular testing, we don't want to be surprised at that time that, oh, we don't have enough specimen and we need to bring back this patient back and repeat the procedure for the molecular pathology testing. It happens many times. I mean, there are two reasons. One is just like, not possible to collect the specimen. So that's a completely different scenario. But many times it just happens when cytology team, which is basically present there to perform the rapid on-site evaluation, they're not communicating with the pulmonologists or the radiologists, and they're not asking for more um, more, more specimen. Because, you know, it, it sometimes gets intimidating because those people 
they're not understanding it and they're not basically providing the specimen, but you need to keep on asking and you need to just be persistent over that. This is something which I've learned from my own experience that you just don't give up until you feel comfortable that you have enough specimen, not only for your uh, surgical pathology or pathology di uh, societal pathology diagnosis, but also for your molecular testing. So this is basically just like a step-by-step, -step, like I just went over real quick that what exactly happened in the EBIS procedure. And you can just see the EBIS bronchoscope, which goes actually inside the lung and then the bronchioles. And this is how you're collecting the specimen. They, after collecting a small bit of specimen, they give, give it to you and then you can put it on the slide and then you can just make two smears. And then uh, the additional specimen, like the, the needle rings goes into the cytolite or formalin. Or like I said, if your difficult flight turned out to be adequate or positive at the time, you can just ask, still ask for more passes and they are going to go directly into this uh, cytolite and formalin for the cell block progression. This is where you stain your uh, difficult slide and the difficult site is ready. And then you see here like these diagnostic cells are present. But again, I just wanted to remind everyone that even though you have these diagnostic cells present, but then when you're doing this rapid on-site evaluation, you always have to remind yourself that you're collecting a specimen, not only for cytology, but you're also collecting specimen for molecular pathology also. So you can keep that thing in your mind and you can ask for additional passes and those passes are going to go directly into your fixative and you can utilize them later on for cell block profession. And this is just an overview of like, you know, how you, you're collecting the specimen and it may or may not be good. So this is basically just the uh, cell block routine methodology. And of course, um, there are routine methods available in the lab. And so one thing which we always have to remember about the cell block that when we make our difficult slide during the rapid onsite evaluation, we evaluate that slide right there on the spot. However, the cell block material which we are collecting, there's no possible way. We basically come up with like a sum method and I'll discuss this later, but normally the cell block slide basically are ready next day. So in the beginning, all what you have is like you centrifuge your material like with the fixative and then you can see this palette and then you go through all these different steps. This is the gel method, which many of the laboratories use at this point. And then when the clot is ready, you just put the clot like into the mesh bag and into the cassette and then it goes into the fixation. And then again, it gets submitted to the cytology lab. And then of course they go after 24 hour of processing into for embedding and, and microtomy. And here it is, you're ready cell block. So after 24 hour, when you see your cell block, you sometimes get surprised because you, you feel that, okay, my diff quick slide has a lot of cells. However, my cell block does not have enough cell. And when you submit something like this to the molecular pathology lab, that lab will reject your specimen. And then, you know, it would just turn out to be like, non-optimal, uh, scanty and NOS, you know? So this is like a scanty and in this you here, you could just see that even though the cells are present, you 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 may think that, oh yeah, there's not enough cells are present, but however, if you, if you could see here, uh, there's a lot of inflammation also present along with the cells. So it may not be a good specimen for molecular pathology. However, like at this small group here, uh, they're clean tumor cells, so it could be a good optimal specimen for molecular pathology. Uh, we basically came up with like a new method and a new technique. So this is what we do. Like whenever during the FNA or like EBIS procedure, when we collect the specimen uh, to make the cell block, instead of putting it in the fixative, we actually keep putting it on a little small tissue paper on a slide, as you could just see here. This is a closer view. And then, and then we, it's each pass is going over here. And then, you know, since we're putting it on the tissue uh, tissue paper, this is absorbing all the liquidy part of the material. And then all which is remaining left on this tissue paper is a clot. And here you could just see, this is a very nice slide because he, you can just see that when we collect this specimen during FNA procedure, this is as much like the size of this clot, like which we are able to collect because we are not diluting it by adding it into the fixative. So we are basically just collecting this clot like on the tissue paper and letting this clot to dry. And when it dries, finally, it just turned out into like a little small biopsy, like core biopsy, which we discussed before, that it may not be feasible for patient. But here we're collecting this through like our EBIS procedure through like FNA procedure. And then we're basically turning like that little specimen into a clot ourselves. And here on the left side, you can see the results. I mean, it's a beautiful cell block with a lot of malignant cells present. 
and uh, that that is actually something which is good and um, it's good enough for molecular testing also. And here you can see the the difference between like uh, these two. So this is the E. This is smear. Uh, this is basically the papinaclaw pep stain. When we stain this our slide next after bringing back to the laboratory, enough diagnostic tissue is present, but more than that is actually present on our tissue cloth. And this actually is basically going to be a really beautiful specimen for our molecular pathology testing. And this is a closer view of like the thing. So this is a slightly different technique and which we do not use here at John Hopkins. And the reason why I added this slide here because uh, uh, this technique I have utilized in another institution I used to work before and we validated this method. So during EBIS procedure, when we collect uh, our DIFQUIC slide, uh, we, we make our DIFQUIC slide, and we know that at that time that enough diagnostic cells are present on the slide. So basically, after collaborating with the molecular pathology lab, what we uh, implemented is like collection uh, from instead of utilizing the cell block, we were actually utilizing the different slide, and then after marking those cells, scraping them from that slide, and then using it directly for the molecular pathology testing, and then submitting it for NGS sequencing, and then you know our basically result, we get the tumor actually we found on through that NGS sequencing, it was 100%. So it was a very very successful method, but not everybody use, use, uses this method. But of course, many many institutions basically now going this route also because not because and, and the reason is again because you know cell block is the matter most of the places use but you may or may not have enough cells present on the cell block so you know most of the institutes some now are considering this method also because you can tell at the time of the collection of the specimen that if you have enough cells are present or not. And um, this is basically, I just made a little small chart just to kind of compare the pros and cons of why using smear is better than the cell block. I mean, they both basically come with their own challenges and then, you know, of course, uh, benefits also. So it's just a little comparison between the two. So this is actually um, a study, like I told earlier, that when we collect the specimen, you know, it's very hard to tell that it's going to be good enough for making, a, for a good cell block next year or not. So Actually, and again, this is a study we did like in a previous institution I used to work before. Uh, uh, me and one of my pathologists, we did that. So basically at the time when we collect the specimen, we basically uh, were observing the, how the specimen looks like at the time of the collection. Either it's acellular or like bloody or like with a particle, with no particle and stuff like that. So based on that, we basically came up with like some results which are actually present on my next slide. And basically, this is what we found out. We basically, that the study which we did, we basically concluded that, that um, if we, at the time of the FNA, like you know, when we collecting the specimen, if it appears bloody with particles, then you know our results were basically this, that they were adequate numbers of, you know, it was adequate for molecular testing. I mean, we had adequate number of uh, cytology cells, but at the same time, we had enough cells present for uh, molecular pathology testing. However, on the other hand, if we have the specimen, I, when we are collecting, you know, and if it's colorless with no particles, we found out later, you know, after doing this study on several specimens that um, all those specimens which were colorless at the time of the collection and there was no particle, they actually did not have enough cells, not only for cytology diagnosis, but also for molecular pathology diagnosis. And again, this was just a study. I mean, you know, it's not like for sure, but this is BV. I think we did this testing on at least like 60 specimens. And this is what we basically concluded. But again, the take home lesson is again, that when the, the best decision which, we, which you can make is actually the time when you are in the procedure room, along with the person who's collecting the specimen, this is your chance of asking and requesting that person to collect the specimen and guide that pulmonologist or the radiologist to collect the right specimen on time. Because if you miss this chance, uh, it doesn't really matter that you know later on you can utilize whatever technique. If you don't have diagnostic cells which you have collected at the time of the collection, I don't think so that any technique will work on that, and then you will not be able to get the good specimen for these tumor markers. That's it. Thank you. Next slide. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Khan. That was a fascinating presentation. Let, yeah, let's take questions and comments. 
If you'd like to share, please click reactions at the bottom of your screen for raise hand. We can call on you. I see a few questions in the chat. Is the wait time for the clot done in the procedure room or is the specimen being brought back to the lab to clot before processing and formalin? It's actually in the procedure room. Uh, it's actually about be collecting the specimen. Uh, is that, but if it's because normally the EBIS procedures are very, very long procedures and it just, you know, sometimes many people, those who are aware of those procedures, they know that it's like sometimes it takes more than an hour. So most of the time you can just wait, but you can always bring back that tissue paper because you have a cart. So you can just bring back like safely back to your laboratory and then do that. Wonderful. Another follow-up oh, question. Did the scraping need to be validated for biomarker testing due to the methanol and Diffquick solution? Yeah, it is basically. So when we did it, of course, uh, like I said, we collaborated with the molecular pathology uh, department and the molecular pathology was involved and there. So basically that entire process before you do it, it was validated. And this scraping was basically getting done, not in cytology uh, department. It was getting done in the molecular pathology. So all cytology was required to do is submit that diagnostic slide and then you can just mark it but then they basically will take care of all the rest of the step but in definitely that study that method needs to be validated before you just perform that wonderful one more question we had in advance what are some biomarker barriers you are currently facing i mean it very really, i mean of course when it comes to like a tumor acquisition, uh, of course, even though I, I have to say that our cytology specimen are because of the clot method, which we use here, it's actually, we don't have a lot of challenges lately, just because the reason that we're using the right technique. But I mean, of course, sometimes specimen is not good to begin with. Like I said in the beginning that at the time when you're collecting the e your specimen during EBIS procedure, sometimes the person who's uh, the operator, like who's collecting the specimen is failed to, get the specimen. So even, and then we have very limited number of cells are present even on our quick flight, or sometimes they're not even present, you know, like something is non-diagnostic. So in that, in that scenario, of course, we are actually, it's, it, we are challenged, but it just, like I said, in cytology, it hardly ever happens. And then of course, in surgical biopsy, if sometimes what happen, like if, if we have the surgical biopsy or even the cell block for cytology, if it's been used, for many other different reasons for IC staining and we don't have leftover tissue, then of course, sometimes it just happened that we don't have enough tissue remaining for our molecular pathology. It happens. Thank you so much, Ms. Khan. And before we, we take a break, we're going to um, take a comment from Lynette Pinot. Go ahead. Thank you, Dara, and thank Gazal for your presentation as a fellow cytotechnologist or cytologist now with the new naming convention, right? And uh, an AP manager as well. I really enjoyed the presentation, so thank you. Um, Dara will be uh, moving us into a work session after our break, and I just want to encourage everyone who's here with us today to stick around. I know as laboratorians, we don't usually like to do group participation things, but um, the team has really done a great job of putting some interactive uh, tools together for us and also some really fun um, videos that we can use to kind of spur some ideas in the breakout session. So I just encourage, you, encourage all of you to stick around and join in the fun when we get to that part. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Lynette. And I see also uh, another comment in the chat, a sharing of experience. If you want to take a look at that, thank you for sharing. We are going to take the short break now before shifting into the working session, which will be with Lynette, our expert facilitator. Um, we'll be talking about solution-oriented steps towards quality improvements in your lab. So please come ready to share ideas. We'll break until 145 Central or 245 Eastern, just a short bit, and please come back at that time. Welcome back to the interactive component of today's event as we move into a working session. We're delighted to have Lynette Pinot facilitating who you just met. She's a leader in the field and has experience in patient-centric CQI, in particular for non-small cell lung cancer patients. So this working session will revisit topics presented by Ghazal Khan and highlight another bright spot from the field 
an example of quality improvements that have had a significant impact in the lab at MD Anderson. We'll also discuss solutions-oriented steps towards similar improvements you might consider making in your own lab. As you see, we have visual frameworks to guide your discussion, and you will be able to participate by simply typing your comments, which will go on sticky notes, as you see here. And this way we'll have an anonymous record of ideas shared. We will have about 45 minutes in this activity, and in a moment you will receive a prompt to join the breakout room. And when time is up, you'll be redirected back to this main room for our final uh, multidisciplinary panel, which will follow. If you are in industry, we invite you to stay right where you are to observe from the sidelines. We will let you know what's happening in the breakout rooms. If you're part of the lab and you don't automatically get moved into a breakout room, please let us know and we'll get you in as quickly as possible. Enjoy your discussions. So at this point, they are likely reviewing the steps that they're going to be working through. We have a few steps in the activity. Highlight Johns Hopkins QI solutions shared. Explore additional solutions to challenges. In the next step, they're going to watch a Bright Spot uh, video, uh, Problem Solve Potential Solutions. And we're going to be watching that video in, in the main session here as well. I will be sharing that with you. And after the video, uh, evaluate applicability in your lab, what would necessitate adaptation. And then finally, target your action plan goals, first action steps. So I'm just going to zoom out a bit and see if I can see where the group is gathered. Uh, so at this point, they have moved beyond uh, introductions and they are now discussing takeaways, uh, key takeaways from the presentation. So attendees are being asked to, to offer some alternate solutions. And so let's see if we have anything um, that shows up on the screen. So we see here that we do have uh, someone who volunteered that they performed a study with pulmonology for optimal core collection in our experience. And we see here that another problem uh, was added to the board. And this one was that they flagged a block within uh, their beaker LIS. So it looks like they are about to view a video and I will start a new share and play that video here for everyone. So the problem that our lab noticed was that we were not meeting the FDA approved fixations time for many of our processes. As you know, most tissue coming to histology are used downstream for many other testing, such as IHC, FISH, cytogenetics, ISH, and immunohistochemistry. And we noticed that we were not meeting that time we were meeting them during the weekday, but we were not meeting those during the holiday and long weekends. What made it hard in our lab is like many histology labs, we only work Monday through Friday, which is okay for histology, but it's not okay for all the other testings downstream. 
we have to really think out of the box. Our tissue is used for many other testing that the patients need, not just an H&E. Uh, we notice that our labs cannot just be Monday through Friday. We need to really expand those operational hours to include Saturday. Another thing we noticed is that our labs used many FDA approved staining kits for IHC, especially the PDO1 for non small cell lung carcinoma. And that protocol has a standard fixation time that we were not meeting over the weekend. Not following these protocols could cause inconsistent result and false negative staining. Also, this would be deviating from our staining processes that are required for these FDA approved kit. Yes, we could have looked at our time for each specimen, but imagine looking through each biopsy to see when it was the time was collected and if it was meeting the fixation time. And like I said earlier, we only had histology open Monday through Fridays. One of the first things we did in our lab is we looked for the most stringent fixation process then and made that a standard for our lab. And we noticed that the most stringent were six to 72 hours a tissue should fix in formalin. So to keep the same lab processing schedule, we had to run the tissue the same way we run it weekly. So we had to quickly adapt to new processes. And this new process was shifting the positions to cover Saturdays. So now we would not be a lab that just was Monday through Friday, but we would be a lab that would be Monday through Saturday. We decided that we would need to rotate. Also, it's a good way for everybody to understand and know the reason why we were making these changes. The way we came about this is that first we created a safety huddle. All of us got together and by speaking and telling what was the problem, how we needed to meet these FDA approved, not for us, but for our patients, gave the employee the ownership of making these changes. And so during our safety huddle, we talked about how we were not meeting the uh, fixation time and how we needed to do that because we were actually deviating from the process. So what we did is we started rotating the employees and they were able to participate and be part of this change of this quality improvement process. So we came up with a collaborative plan and we considered all the other process outside of histology. So we had to work with the other department groups to develop a sustainable solution to this problem. The most important thing that we got out of this is that we were able to communicate with other departments to meet all the needs for our patients. When I started in histology, it was a Monday through Friday and after Friday, you go home. And we never thought about downstream. We never thought about those other tests, but fixation is the beginning of everything. And maintaining these times is super important for all the other downstream tests. And so in histology, we have learned that we need to be flexible. Since we are the ones that collect that tissue from the clinician, they give it to us in formula, and we need to be good stewards to ensure that that tissue stays within the required hours and not exceed or make the time shorter. We need to make sure that we take care of that tissue for these downstream tests for our patients. All right, so following the video, participants are being asked how the problem can be solved. So sometimes what happens, uh, some folks are not comfortable using uh, murals. So Dara is kind enough to uh, have them 
type in the Zoom chat function, and she's taking that and copying and pasting it into Mural. So although we saw that it was uh, Dara who uh, inserted this text, this was a contribution from one of our participants. So now we move to the next step. And the question being posed is, in your lab, what is your NSCLC CQI priority? And what would you need to improve or adapt for your lab setting? So we see one comment added here under the priority question. So what is your priority? Is that the priority is communication between oncology and the lab for biomarker testing. Oh, we have another one. And what is, oh, there we go. And there we go. I signed up for this summit because I need updated information for my lung cancer lecture. Oh. <laughs> to first year med students. Attendees are now invited to share their thoughts on uh, what would be needed to improve or adapt for their lab, their lab setting. And the first share is QNS rates post test. So we see here that we have a question that is being posed. With the tissue paper technique, how do you avoid dry out of the clot, which can make cutting difficult? Now, I'm hoping that an answer will actually be typed on screen. Unfortunately, I suspect it's going to be answered verbally, perhaps we can try to ask it again later when we gather again after the breakout. Okay, wonderful. Welcome back. We are now at the final portion of today's session, a multidisciplinary panel discussion in which we will explore how teams work through making key decisions in the areas of tissue acquisition and processing. Uh, on today's panel, we'll hear perspectives from Lynette Pinot, Manager of Laboratory Operations and Genetic Counseling Services in Medical Laboratory and Pathology Services at Regents Hospital Health Partners, and the team from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Peter B. Ale, Associate Professor of Pathology and Oncology, Ghazal Khan, Anatomic Pathology Manager Two, and Dr. Lani Yarmus, Clinical Director in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine and Associate Professor of Medicine. So, before we get started, we're going to begin with a quick poll temperature check. So if you could please address the following question, how many of you have a ROSE program in place at your institution for lung cancer? You can select our institution has a ROSE program in place, is in the process of establishing a ROSE program, or our institution does not have a ROSE program for lung cancer. And looks like everyone has a ROSE program in place who has responded. Um, our goal today is wherever your institution's at in the process with ROSE implementation, that you come away with new ideas or a fresh perspective that you can apply to strengthen communication within your working teams. So you know what to expect. Here's the format we will use for our discussion. 
Uh, we'll be asking the panelists some prepared questions to address issues of impact to the team. And we also welcome you to submit any additional questions through the chat. Let's get started. So here's the first question for anybody to take a stab at. In your organization, how has the diagnostic journey and workup for a lung cancer patient evolved? I can take it. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Lonnie Yarmus. I'm a joint interventional pulmonologist. Um, so for those not familiar, our subspecialty is really just very much focused on minimally invasive diagnostics, predominantly for, for lung cancer. And so um, Peter and I have been working together for a long time building this program and, and it it really starts with you know the encounters of minimally invasive procedures whether that's bronchoscopy or predominantly transthoracic biopsy now and where things have shifted early on it used to be just can you get a diagnosis now the procedural technologies have matured enough where the presumption is we're going to get a diagnosis and the sort of mature conversation is now how do we get enough tissue and quality of a specimen to ensure that our pathologic colleagues can appropriately test for all the additional immunohistochemical stains and mutations? Um, and so from a from a build standpoint, I, I think a lot of that has been communication and optimization of existing um, resources. So Rose for us has been an extremely critical resource that we have the luxury of having it available for thanks to Peter's support and pathology of, of really every procedure we do. Um, it's cytotechnologists who do that in the room with us. And that allows us not so much additional advantage for diagnosis, but specimen quality and quantity and a reflex to pathology with that communication line in the room to ensure that the right tests are reflex to be ordered um, as quickly as possible to reduce turnaround time. And then in addition, the quality metrics of being able to track, you know, what our rates of insufficient tissue are and try and target um, different interfaces to optimize if there are any gaps. In our experience, it really started with the change in the um, guidelines from the United States Preventative Services Task Force back in 2014, when um, screening became part of the guidelines for, um, for patients. And I think, you know, that was really a turning point in our program um, because our organization did um, take a system approach to really try and start uh, screening those patients that were asymptomatic, um, you know, 55 to 80, um, 80 years old who had like a 30 pack year smoking history. And so as the organization started implementing that screening program, you know, as part of the screening algorithm is those low dose CT scans. And we started seeing more and more patients, you know, coming through the screen programs in our organization. And then, you know, of course, we're having some diagnoses uh, within that screening. And I think, you know, the smaller those nodules are and the less amount of tissue that you have um, really starts those conversations of how are we really doing the best to optimize acquisition when we have these really small biopsies. So um, I'm actually jealous of Dr. Yermas's comment about being able to track the QNS rates because we are not doing a good job of that. And it's actually one of the things we're trying to work on. But that's really kind of how we got to where we are. I think that that really helped um, catapult our program, so to speak. Uh, but what Lani was saying that we, in our institution, which is a large institution, a larger cytology laboratory, which is separate, it, we only do, and most of us only do uh, cytology. I also do lung pathology, so I'm sort of the outlier. But we have cytotechnologists, and we have enough in our team to allow them to go to these procedures, and, and they tend to last a little longer than others, including also the pancreas. So and the reimbursement for these procedures is not great. So some pathologists feel that uh, it's not uh, very efficient for them to perform that. And in, in our case, we also felt that uh, cytotechnologists with the proper training experience are very well suited for this and our presence is not needed in most of the cases. I mean, if, if it's needed, we go. And so th these are additional. As for the, the tracking the QNS, more and more hospitals are adopting electronic medical records and, and there's a few vendors out there. 
they they advertise themselves as being you know able to generate reports with I think variable success but th that's one way of you know you have to spend time and effort on it sometimes money to, to, to get these programs adequate you know there's very strict criteria of what you have to do with GY and cytology and and uh, the program is built for that so uh, with time I think we will we'll build a program so that in these additional quality uh, para parameters will be included. Thank you for that. Um, let's move on to the next question here. How do you maximize the quality and quantity of tissue or cytology sample for biomarker testing? And in addition, what advances in the field have improved specimen acquisition? Whoever would like to jump in. I can, I can take this question. So, um, in my practice, and like I said, I am a cytotechnologist and I participated in rapid on site evaluation. I think that something which is the most important factor is during the rapid on site evaluation, you need to communicate with your pulmonologist or radiologist, whoever you're working with. And you need to keep on asking for the material until you're satisfied. I think, uh, I think cytotechnologists nowadays, they are quite familiar and they know how to calculate the DNA percentage on cell block or on, you know, difficult side, like I mentioned. So they they have an idea that how much specimen they need. And I think uh, this is something like, you know, they need to def definitely communicate in that room. About the advancement in this field, I think EBIS itself, in my opinion, is like the very advanced technology. And like I said, it's not very old. And like, you know, now robotic EBIS, I mean, it's becoming more and more advanced. So Dr. Yarmouth, I'm sure he's a pulmonologist, he knows like how it's just getting better and better. So <laughs> this is one thing. Second thing is just like I said, in my previous institution, uh, in addition to the cell block, like like I said, here at John Hopkins, the cell block technique which we use, it's tremendous. It's amazing. I've never seen like something like this anywhere else. So this is amazing. But, you know, many institutes, they don't practice that. So in my previous institute, uh, you know, we actually implemented and validated first and then implemented using the diff quick slide and the benefit which i felt was that that while you're in the room you know that uh, on your diff quick because you can you can see that slide and just go right away so actually you can tell right away if you're trained that way that how much dna is present on that slide like is it enough clear like clean not corroded you know by like other inflammatory cells if the tumor cells are there you can actually right away do the calculation in your head and you say okay I'm keeping this like on my, you know, molecular testing and that really works and it's really easy. You don't have to go through the hassle of making the cell block that way. But, you know, of course, having a good cell block method and, you know, the quick methods, you know, in my opinion, they both are good, you know. Thank you. I think the other thing that we've noticed too, and we're not using it, but we've looked at it, are there are so many more platforms that are coming out that are being a little bit more plug and play, so to speak, when it comes to certain biomarkers. You know, none of them are perfect. I don't have that complete panel that we're looking for that's FDA approved. But, you know, the ability to take a small, small piece of a cell block, for example, and put it into a little cassette into an instrument and, you know, a few hours later have two or three biomarker results. I think over time, that's just going to continue to get better and better um, and more user friendly. Uh, so that we are being able to do a little bit more at some of those laboratories that maybe don't have the uh, maybe ability to do like a whole exome sequencing, so to speak, or, you know, next gen sequencing. I mean, in my opinion, in the future of the technology, which could be available, and it's not, in my opinion, it doesn't seem like very complicated. During the FNA procedure, you can just give one pass to like their, you know, whatever the company is, they should have like this collective device or whatever. You can just give one pass to them and it should just be, take it from there, you know? <laughs> and then I'm sure it, it, it is going to be possible in the future how the things are going. Well, you know, one problem is that you, when you do molecular testing, uh, you have to destroy the cell and, and you don't, and you have to know, you should know what percent of the cells are tumor cells. You know, the techniques are variable in terms of the requirement, what percentage that has to be. And some require very little, less than a percent or around 1%, but there has to be tumor cells. Otherwise the negative results are questionable. Yeah, that's a really, really great point. It's one of the reasons we haven't brought in some of that instrumentation is because there those variables 
you know, and a lot of people, I think, don't always understand the difference between some of the different testing modalities, whether it's a molecular versus a fish versus an IHC, and how that implicates companion diagnostics and the like. So it does make it a little bit more complicated and important for people to know so that we make the right decisions for the testing platforms for the patients. I think Great. one other factor to answer this question, what are we doing is the existence of Lani and his program training new people who focus on this, so whose life is to do biopsy of the lung or, or chest cavity. And, you know, we are moving now to the early stage lung cancer with smaller tumors, no lymph nodes, representing a bigger challenge to get enough tissue for molecular studies, because it's not just that it's tumor, but there, there are no neoadjuvant protocols already approved and more is coming. So it's going to get even more um, important to get adequate tissue. Yeah, I think briefly, I'll, the thing I'll add as the pulmonologist is the, you know, the communication between our teams is is unfortunately infrequent in my experience of talking to other institutions. And, and that's probably the most valuable piece here is having these conversations to, for me to understand what's what you guys need um, really helps dictate our procedure and what we do, right? So we're no longer just taking a pass, getting a diagnosis and stopping. We're really taking a pass, using a drop, confirming we have a diagnosis, and then basically instructing that everything else is preserved for ancillary testing. And and that little piece is probably the most important message that um, can be relayed to proceduralists that really will help optimize. They implemented a... Um a quarterly meeting between oncology and uh, pulmonology and pathology to look at those things specifically for lung cancer um, to continue to, we used to meet monthly when we first started kind of rolling out the screening programs. Um, and now it's more of a quarterly, but um, those touch points have been super valuable, especially as we've been choosing uh, markers and ordering sets and testing partners and the like. Yeah, thank you. You're really highlighting the importance of communication. Um, you know, the next question relates to beginning a ROSE program. Um, how would you suggest initiating a ROSE program if a hospital does not already have one in place? And also, who performs ROSE procedures at your organization? Is it cytologist, pathologist, or both? I mean, I can take this uh, the lead here. Uh, uh, so if, if, some, if a program doesn't have ROSE, I would advise them to go somewhere where the rose is performed and observe and maybe identify a few personnel and, and have them get some experience for a, a day or two. And, you know, in the community, cytotechnologists are not very frequently employed and there's also a shortage of them. So even if you if you have a position, sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to fill. But uh, whether it's a cytotechnologist or a pathologist who performs a ROSE, this is one of the hardest areas of cytology to, to do this on-site evaluation for lung uh, specimens. So you need someone with, with the, the skills and the experience. So if you have not done, I would advise them to go get training somewhere uh, or at least some experience. And in our institutions, ROSE is generally performed, as I mentioned before, by cytotechnologists for the uh, bronchoscopy and endoscopy suites. Pathologists still do ultrasound-guided uh, procedures so and, and CT-guided procedures. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, is, is logistics and, and, and time management. For a while, we had cytotechnologists do all the ROSE procedures. But again, with the shortage of cytotechnologists uh, in the last two years, that, that we had to change and, and, and do, you know, pathologists has to perform again. And um, so this, this is what I would recommend. I can also take this question. And the reason I want to take it because I've actually personally experienced initiating a ROSE in a community hospital. That was my first job. And it was interesting because I came to John Hopkins for a job interview. And I realized this thing that John Hopkins cytotechnologists are going and they're performing the rapid outside evaluation. I did not you know, take a position here, but when I went back, uh, I communicated with my lab director about it, and I just told him that how it is so important. My lab director actually allowed me to 
um, go in and communicate with radiologists and all that stuff. So I met each individually each one of them because we did not have any cytopathologists in the room in our department. So of course that was the main reason why we were not doing it. So I had to just basically it started from the scratch, and then when we did it, of course initially it's some challenges, but then later on it would just keep going on and on. Um, I discussed in the tumor board also, and so the clinicians were interested. So this is how we started. And I I strongly believe communication is the key. Like whenever you feel something, there's a solution of a problem. I mean, at that time, you know, of course, I was a, just a new site or technologist, you know, fresh out of the school, I'm very excited. <laughs> so I wanted to do like something out of this, my excitement, right? But then later on, 2007, when EBIS came out, and then, you know, when we started doing like EBIS procedure, then you just realize this thing that how much, important it is because we started with thyroid but then you know later on it became a practice and they're like they're doing a lot of <laughs> a lot of FNA with rose actually every day so it's, it's possible well <clears throat> there's one more thing that people can do and 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 some centers started to do telecytology when there is a not even a cytotechnologist in the room a, a person who is trained to pre prepare the samples make smears and stain them and then uh, place the slide on a on a, an equipment that either scans it or or it can be operated remotely. And the pathologist or a cytotechnologist, usually pathologist, on the other end, in an office, can look and, and evaluate the slides. And it is adds some extra time to it, obviously. Uh, but and technology is improving, so the 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 time extra time because of technology is is, is decreasing. And, but that's one, one thing that uh, I think the future will bring that, you, you know, telecytology will be helpful for roles, even for institutions or groups where they, they don't have the personnel on site. Great. Thank you for that. And you might have touched on it with that answer in mentioning cytotechnologists and cytologists, but who would you say, what are the critical roles and elements in implementing a successful ROSE program? I think, I mean, the critical element is that the, first of all, the, the person who performs it has to have experience or training, Let's say training in it. That's that's the most, it doesn't really matter what, what, who it is. It could be a pathologist who's not born in cytology, but if he has the experience, and there are some older pe people out there who, we, who not, don't have cytology boards because it's only required for cytology since 99 or something like that. And, and uh, so that's, one thing and the other thing the person who does it has to be interested in performing it if 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 you if you do something that you don't like or is just forced on you it's not gonna work so i think those are two key uh, components can i just add like one more comment here too so i i agree with dr la that i think passion you know you <laughs> somebody who's really passionate about it is the key in my opinion because the thing is that you're going in this room and then you have, you are the part of the system there. Like when we do the rapid on-site evaluation, it's not just cytopathology, you know, portion. You're involving every single person in their room. Like you're communicating with, you know, pulmonologists, you're communicating with the nurse who's like, you know, helping you to collect the specimen. Each one is the part of the process and it's a one big team. And your goal is you wanted to collect the best specimen, not only for cytology, but also for molecular pathology tumor markers also. So I think everybody's aware, they all know the history. I mean, his, you know, and this is what you communicate in that room. You're not just going there, collecting the specimen, making a slide. You're also getting informed about what is the patient, what is the possibility of having a tumor in what area, like, you know, if you're doing a lymph node and stuff like that. So all these things, in my opinion, make, make a huge difference. So it's passion and interest is important. And, and touching on what Gazel just mentioned as well, I think, you know, that's a really important piece. When we really started doing EOS and EBUS in, in our experience, there was a lot of communication and orchestration between our proceduralists and the cytotechnologists, cytologists and pathologists um, on how that looks and how that interaction goes and how even just a hand samples off between the proceduralists and the cytologists and the timing, and especially with some of those EVA specific procedures where you have multiple lymph nodes and they take so long as, as um, Peter was saying, you know, just getting used to it. And we have a residency pro program for pul pulmonology as well and a fellowship. So, you know, this constant kind of ebb and flow within that process of 
educating that team, you know, the procedural team, the pulmonology team of like how, how this interaction can do, we want to be as efficient as possible. We know we don't all want to be in here forever, but at the same time, we want to do the best thing we can for the patient. And so we did have a lot of way in the beginning conversations about, you know, how this dance should look between the cytologist or pathologist who's down there. Um, we have a cytologist that goes down for, for you. It's very, very similar to what um, was discussed for John Hopkins. Uh, we will pull a pathologist in if we have a, a challenging case or something, but, you know, just having those relationships and those conversations and helping to constantly kind of improve that competency on both sides of the team continues to help um, as we develop and continue our programs. Great. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, a question just came through the chat. Why don't we jump over there? Um, what percent of viable tumor cells on the DQ smear qualifies it for removal of these cells for a DNA workup? So the, basically the requirement remains the same, like, you know, uh, which I outlined in my, in my presentation, it doesn't really matter if you're uh, utilizing um, a diff quick smear or you're using a cell block smear, you know, in both the scenario, like, I think it needs to be like a 28% of your tumor cells, like separated from the rest of the cells, or like, I, I, I think I believe like uh, 60,000 to like 150,000 cells should be present and those should be tumor cells. And the tumor cells should be nucleated. It is also very important. So, you know, so whoever is evaluating that slide, you know, they need to, um, you know, kind of keep those criteria in mind. And these criteria vary slightly from lab to lab, but, but more or less, I believe, it's just basically the similar requirement. So, yeah, you know, jumping in a little bit, uh, it really depends on what uh, methodology is used for subsequent testing. So Sanger sequencing, which no one uses anymore, it used to require 20% purity. Uh, you know, the most uh, PCR that is, is probably widely used for EGFR and some other targets or NGS, they can uh, use significantly lower number of uh, percentage of tumor cells, like in the one to 5% range. So if you wanna be playing safe, so if 10% would be a good number. And for like a large panel NGS, you probably need 5,000 cells or so. Um, you may get away with uh, fewer than that, and, and the tumor cells. So uh, that that gives you an idea how many how many cells you want to see on 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 the diff quick stain. And you don't have to count the whole slide. You know, you go to areas and on one high power field, you, you make an assessment. Oh, there's about like 200 slides here, 100 slides, and then you just multiply it and quickly you get an idea. If you have a thousand, it's no, no big deal. So that's what I would do. Thank you. Here, here's a follow-up to that. Can you use PAP stained smears? Actually, yes, you, have you have to validate it. You have to validate, yeah. And you can, but one challenge along with the PAP smear is this, that um, it requires removing the, you know, the cover slip. So while you're making the diff quick slide, you can keep it on cover slip at the time, you know, when you're collecting the specimen. However, pep stain, you definitely cover slip and then you have to remove that. So it takes more steps, but it's possible in my opinion. Okay, so, so alcohol fixation doesn't interfere with the DNA or RNA as much as formalin. So you will be okay to, to do that. One thing for PAP, alcohol fix slides and pep stain slides, especially if you want to do fluorescent inside reorganization, that's not going to work that well. The probe doesn't penetrate and the stain, you can destain it, but sometimes it's imperfect. So you get autofluorescence from the eosin. So you, you will not do, be able to do fish as much as on a, on a diff quick slide. Because diff quick, you put it in alcohol, it immediately dissolves everything, you know, you know it bleaches it out. Great, thank you. Well, backing up to the interdisciplinary communication in your lab, have you implemented a process improvement initiative to track or to improve QNS rates? For anyone who would like to jump in. I can just say uh, something that, you know, what we did, and I, I'm not sure Dr. Uh, Dr. Lake can talk about here, but uh, I know that in my previous institute, like we used to report the percentage of the, so for example, uh, if, if we, uh, both on the cell block as well as on the, the quick smear, we used to put like at the bottom of the report, uh, that how much percentage of the DNA is present. Like it was basically uh, a required thing for the pathologist, for the cytopathologist to do. And that was basically we put in place because uh, 
our oncologists, you know, our clinicians during tumor board, they probably just requested that. So we started, or like our pulmonologists also, they basically just wanted us to just provide that in a report that, you know, if uh, we have adenocarcinoma, you know, right, go, whatever, but then uh, do we have like enough percentage, which is going to be good enough for, you know, the molecular testing. And they said the reason why they want us to do that, because then they look at the report based on that, it's easier for them to order something like if they wanted to jump right away and then order something later on, they could do that. But this is something which we did. I'm not aware of any other uh, thing, like I haven't done it. <laughs> Yeah, as you know, at Hopkins, we do the same. We try to uh, comment in the diagnosis on the adequacy of the tissue, what it can be used for. And furthermore, communication is key again. And then if we don't get enough, we, we should communicate to the proceduralist that we di they didn't get enough. So maybe, uh, and also the, because sometimes you don't know who the oncologist is. Often there's no oncologist yet because there's no diagnosis. So and then to, to reschedule the patient for additional procedure or, or collect blood if it's advanced stage and send it for liquid biopsy. So, so communication is key. The easiest for the pathologist is to put in a note, get macros that gets at the end of the report. Like in resections, you know, the, in, in the cap forms and in many other people when they do the, the reporting on the tumors, identify a block that has adequate tissue for testing. In biopsies, usually it's only one, two blocks, so uh, you can do that, or just in general comment, there's enough tissue to do this and not that. I will add that it is never the proceduralist's fault. No, of course not. <laughs> um, but, but, no, I'm kidding. But, uh, but th you know, there's a lot of efforts on our side too, and, and I think it's important for, for you guys to understand that it's, it is not just Right? You can only do what you could do with what's provided. Um, and so we're working actually very closely with Peter. So I'm actually chairing an international guideline that is just on after you hand the EBIS needle over, what do you do with it, right? That's the entire guideline and it's Peter's part of it. We have other pathology colleagues um, to really look at ways for you know specimen preservation and optimization with minimally invasive samples and also looking for ways to you know to help improve that across platforms understanding that not everybody has the resources that we're fortunate to have here and so we're also initiating with peter and pathologies help we have a multi-centered randomized controlled trial looking at different um, techniques of just what we do with the tissue. Do we put it in a liquid medium or do we create what we call a, a clot coagulum or clot technique that is what our preferential use here is and, and trying to show those outcome differences, looking at QNS rates as a primary outcome. So there's a lot of effort in the field to try and optimize beyond just rows or direct pathologic interpretation. True. And, and, you know, in the community, sometimes, you, you know, there's not enough tissue to do wow. testing. And then the blame game starts. You know, you didn't give me enough. No, you lost it. Or And, and, and both can be true at uh, the same time or at different times. And, and But again, you have to talk to each other and, and then you hammer it out. And if it really doesn't, you know, work, then get someone, get some help, get someone in who you trust or who you think you, you can do or go some other place and see what, what they do. There are some new technologies. There are some automated systems that are out there. Some uh, are better than others. Again, th those are extra costs. So it, depending on the volume, that may not make sense. But but everyone can try to establish a, a good protocol that works most of the time. And nothing is 100%. You also have to get your, your expectations right. If you go to a one centimeter right upper lobe lesion, peripheral lesion, that's very li likely that you're not going to get too much tissue. But if you have a three centimeter a bulky mediastinal lymph node, you should get enough tissue, uh, no problem, every time. And so, so you have to, you know, match these expectations. Thank you. You know, you're reiterating that it's all about working together. And, you know, the next question is about. Can you describe the coordination efforts for biomarker testing that are working well at your organization and do gaps exist? Uh, so 
we, we, in, in our institutions, cytology separates from pathology, surgical pathology. So if there's a procedure where there's an EBUS done and an FNA that comes to us, if there's a transbronchial biopsy that goes to surgical pathology, so two different people read it, and you may get two NGS requests, the lab, you know, molecular lab. Usually they catch it because it's the same MRN and you know same same date and and uh, and right now because of regulatory reasons, you know the requirement that the procedure is ordered by a treating physician. There is a mechanism in place where the molecular lab will only do it if everything is in place. So they 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 catch these double orders. So that's one thing that if if there are two different silos, then this can happen. Now, in most institutions, it's the same person uh, reading both type of specimens. So in, in their question is, is, is it getting to the same person? But if, if it does, that, that's, that's, that's of an issue. And then you order the, the, the test on the best material. It doesn't matter whether it's a cell block or a, or a transbronchial biopsy tissue block. If the cell block has more tumor, you order it on the tumor. And, and then uh, immunohistochemistry for biomarker in lung, it's PDL1. You need tissue, so you, you cannot do it on smears. So you really need tissue. So you, you but you only need a, uh, the minimum number of cells, 100. So so then you, you can use much smaller sample f just for that. You can utilize fluids like pleural fluids is a great specimen uh, for for lung cancer. It's automatically a stage four disease if it's in the pleural fluid. And that you have to understand as well. So, when is it when your protocol says only advanced stage lung cancer should be tested? So the the source of the specimen, the site already tells you a lot about what stage it is, and you can always look it up. And in coordinating between the molecular lab and pathology, uh, what we we're doing now is uh, we have done for a long time is that there was a dedicated person who identified the, the tumor cells for the lab. Uh, whether it's adequate or not, uh, and then they they took that sample and processed it. So because you know molecular pathologists may not be trained in lung pathology or pancreas pathology or cytology, so it takes the time for for them to to get the experience to identify the tumor cells in in that specimen because it's not quite straightforward, especially in in, in cytology material. So th th these are the issues that, uh, you know, we face. I think you bring up a really good point about ordering them. Our orders are set up a little bit differently where the orders are actually placed by the oncologists, not by the pathologists. Um, and so we have a panel that's set up for them to order that we've agreed on. But your point of, are they always ordering it um, appropriately based on staging? You, you know, we, we think that most of our oncologists are pretty good at that, but, you know, have we really gone back and looked at it? That's something we haven't measured. The other thing is, you know, we have a panel of 13 biomarkers that we're going to send in. And, you know, are we always, you know, double checking or is there anybody looking to say, you know, has anything ever been run previously on this patient in case they're like, transferred further in their system or something? You know, that's the other thing too where um, I think we have some opportunity in just ordering in general um, and how that looks to your point to make sure things are appropriately um, ordered. Great, thank you. Well, let's, let's move into, we're almost out of time. Let's wrap up with a final question, which is if you could leave us with one suggestion in regards to tissue acquisition and or processing that the group could take action on today. What would that be? I can take this question first. Uh, so I think that my only uh, first and the most important advice to everyone is when you are in the, during the EVIS procedure, you always ask for more tissue. Because again, I have to say, it doesn't really matter what technique are you using, what methods you're <laughs> trying. If you don't have tissue in your container, you cannot win. So communicate, communication in that room is very important. And like I said, EBIS, during the EBIS rapid on-site evaluation is a communication, you know, which involves every single person in the room. So everyone is the, you know, team member. It's, you know, you, you have to have a working relationship with each one of them, you know, and that basically everybody should just understand the whole reason or purpose behind this procedure and then, you know, help each other and then, you know, 
Um, because I, I and the reason why I'm saying that because you know when I was I was not very experienced cytotechnologist, you get excited because your focus is all, all, only on cytology. So the minute you see the diagnostic cells on the slide, you're like, hey, yeah, I got it. And the minute you said that your pulmonologist thing, okay, they have enough specimen, they don't have to go again. But then I learned it from pathologists rather in the room because they always like were hesitant in saying this. But later on, when you you know understand the big picture, you understand as a matter of fact why pathologists are making this comment because it's not this needed only for making a cytology diagnosis. You need IC stain or maybe you know a molecular pathology, whatever. So you, there are many other reasons why you need to have a good sample before you leave the room because it's not very easy to bring the patient back again in that room. It's a lot of hassle to the patient, to you know the institution also. So I think my only one advice to everyone is just speak, communicate, and try to get as much specimen as you possibly can. Thank you. Z, I have a quick suggestion. Come to our EBUS course in Cambridge, Maryland in the summer. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Are you teaching? <laughs> we both do. And actually, it's it's kind of a nice probably wrap up because it, it we have separate sessions, right? It's a proceduralist course, but yet the most popular station is Peter and our Cytotechs up, uh, you know, preparation of, of a row sample. Um, so, you know, the words out, I think in the, in the pulmonary community. So my little pitch is just reach out to your invasive, you know, our minimally invasive colleagues and just have the conversation because I think, uh, you know, just a little bit of effort on what's needed on both ends goes a long way. Thank you so much, panelists, for a really insightful exchange of ideas. It's much appreciated. And we welcome everyone to continue the discussion on our Facebook uh, biomarker testing group. We are now at the end of today's video conference. Uh, we want to thank you all for your participation and please take 30 seconds to complete the brief survey which will appear on your screen um, as you leave. Your input will help shape future educational initiatives and also please join us tomorrow for day two of the best practices in biomarker testing for NSCLC virtual summit and thank you again this concludes our presentation.